This week on Morning Mika, House Republicans can't count. The yeas are 214 and the nays are 216. The resolution is not adopted. As they fail to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary for not closing the border, while they killed a bill that would have closed the border, also denying aid to Ukraine and Israel. It's all thanks to the MAGA munchkins, their math challenge speaker, Mike Johnson, and ultimately the wizard himself, Donald Trump. Oh, yes, the wizard of MAGA Oz is still calling the shots in Congress, pushing the GOP to do literally anything, no matter how demeaning or destructive. This wizard certainly has a strong hold over his munchkins. The question is, Will the courts finally pull back the curtain on citizen Trump and send him to jail for life? You see, it turns out he is just a citizen as the indicted ex-president lost his immunity case in Washington, D.C. this week. Poor Trumpy thought, like a wizard, he could do anything to anyone. The judges said... No, Donald Trump is not above the law, nor entitled to, quote, unbounded authority to commit crimes. We shall see what the Supreme Court says. And speaking of, there's another case in front of the Supreme Court right now to decide whether or not Trump can even be on the Colorado ballot because of his involvement in the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. All this as the increasingly confused Republican frontrunner faces massive fines. He already owes $83.3 million for defamation. And now he's on the hook for massive years-long financial fraud. That penalty could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Who would take orders from a guy like this? Will the scarecrows in Congress ever find their brains? If I only had a brain. Maybe even their hearts? and courage while they're at it. What have they got that I ain't got? Courage. You could say that again. I'm Mika Brzezinski here with Simone Sanders Townsend, Huma Abedin, and Jen Psaki. Jen, Republican lawmakers showed us this week that they are actively working against the Biden administration when it comes to border legislation. What can the Biden White House do to get around the Trump munchkins in Congress? Well, first of all, Mickey, you've made me really think differently about the Wizard of Oz, but it is such a perfect analogy that Trump is like the wizard who doesn't have actual powers and pretends he does. He's just a regular guy um, who's doing lots of bad things. I would say for the current White House, if you're sitting in there, you know, obviously it would be better for them if this border deal had passed, because it is an issue on the minds of voters across the country. As much as this was an imperfect deal that some portion of the Democratic Party and electorate did not like, and, and there were things about it that uh, were, were warranted in their dislike. But I would say for them, the key here is the dysfunction message, because you look at just what Senator Lankford had to say in his floor speech, which I thought was so powerful, and a number of of other yeah. Republicans who are conservative, um, who um, many of us may not agree with on particularly their policy issues, but they're here and they're trying to do something. They're trying to get something done. And they're basically saying to the public, we're in charge and we don't have the ability to deliver for you. And that's a very powerful message for the White House, for the, not just the White House, but the campaign to amplify, because it's right in that dysfunction chaos versus we're fighting for you and we're going to try to get things done for the American people. Simone, meanwhile, Trump has a lot of legal problems. Uh, just how big a blow is this immunity decision to the former president as the Supreme Court is hearing arguments on whether he's even eligible in Colorado? The immunity question to me is kind of interesting. Did he win because he bought time or is it ultimately going to hurt him? 
Well, look, I think what the appeals court said about immunity, and let's just be very clear, they said that the president, not only does Donald Trump, but any president does not have immunity from crimes just because they were, in fact, the president of the United States. And they can, in fact, be prosecuted for coming out of office. And I think that's really important because Donald Trump's lawyers made arguments in court that basically said Donald Trump could, or any president, could order an assassination, if you will, of a political rival uh, and not be held accountable for that. They were literally in one of the highest courts of our land saying the president can kill people and because they are the president, they can get away with it. That, that sounds crazy, but that's exactly what they were saying. And so the courts here, I think, are, have been a, a key partner in beating back some of the crazy from Donald Trump and reestablishing and underscoring that we are a nation of laws. Now, I don't know, Mika, about what the court, what the Supreme Court is going to do when it comes to um, if they're even going to take up the immunity question because the appeals court was so thorough, my legal friends tell me, or what they're going to do about this question of Donald Trump being eligible to sit on the ballot, his name appear on the ballot. This particular yeah. Supreme Court um, is one that I know people like to say the Supreme Court is objective and they don't look at politics, but this particular Supreme Court has a track record of, 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 of doing the opposite of that. They do look at politics. It, it feels for yeah. many Americans that it's not objective. So we're going to have to wait and see. But the fact that these conversations are being had, that the American people can tune in and listen to it, it's going to be up on YouTube, all these other places, that is important. They need to hear with their own ears and be able to see with their own eyes what folks are doing and saying, especially somebody who claims he wants to, who wants to be the next president of the United States, again. So, Huma, let's get back to this border debacle where Republicans complained about the border. They struck this incredible deal, bipartisan legislation, the best you could ever get either in the past or the future. This was it. And they kill it. How can the Biden administration communicate this? They own this. But, you know, they're also already beginning and you see it on other networks to lie about it. How can the White House communicate this colossal failure on the part of the GOP? Well, you know, to Jen's point, I agree. We're, we're, this is, we're talking about the divide between chaos versus a controlled plan. And I think this is a real opportunity uh, for the, the Biden campaign in particular to proactively say, and it's always bad when you're uh, in a campaign to be on the defensive. And this is a real opportunity for them to proactively um, show, reveal, remind voters about the chaos on the Republican side of the aisle here, led by um, our new wizard. I also, like Jen, will never be able to watch that uh, movie again through the same with the same light. But showing that they have a plan. You know, Chuck Schumer was on Morning Joe yesterday with the plan up on the screen, saying this is what uh, you know what the legislation, if it passed, uh, would do. And I think it's continuing to. Um, uh, kind of amplify that message, remind voters uh, what a Trump another Trump administration would do to this country. Um, and, 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 and I think it gives these guys a real opportunity, the Democrats a real opportunity to say, uh, we have a real plan to fix things. And, 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 and I think that's a only bodes well uh, in an election that seems like there's a lot unwell. Mika, can I say one thing about <laughs> yeah, what Huma just said? Yeah. Uh, you know, it just she is right. Democrats have a plan. I think the reality here is is that the reason Republicans are in charge of the House is because the American people voted them in there. They gave them that power, very narrow majority, but they gave it to them. And what did they get for that? Uh, a mess. Uh, uh, words that I might not even use right here on on with with you know my lovely friends. But if the American people don't like what they have. The, the chaos that the Republicans are providing them, they have an opportunity to make their voices heard at the ballot box because every single member of the House of Representatives is up for re-election in November. Like, this is... The, the chaos that is before us is chaos, frankly, that the American people voted for. They wanted to give Republicans in the House a chance for whatever reason. What have they gotten for that chance? And so I think there's one uh, thing that the campaign can do, but... These other Democrats out there and people who just care about democracy um, need to just make it plain. Vote. I'll use the word. They've gotten in return for their votes a <laughs> show. Uh, so let's put that Republican <laughs> show aside uh, for just a moment and talk about winners rather than losers, right? Okay. Women. 
won big at the Grammys this week. And I think there's a powerful political message behind all of this. You had Taylor Swift making history with her record-breaking fourth album of the year. Miley Cyrus celebrated her big win with a subtle change to her hit song, Flowers. I didn't want to leave you, but had to. I didn't want to fight, but we did. Started to cry, then remembered, I just won my first Grammy! I love it when she skips off. Uh, there were some amazing 50 over 50 moments as well. Tracy Chapman performed her 1988 classic, Fast Car, alongside country star Luke Holmes. Celine Dion, who had been, uh, who's at 55, she'd been out of the public eye with a rare neurological disorder. Uh, Celine Dion was a surprise presenter. And then there was 80-year-old Joni Mitchell, who captivated the crowd with a chilling rendition of her 1969 classic, Both Sides Now. But clouds got in my way Somehow that song even more powerful as she sings it at 80 years old. Talk about an icon with a cane in her hand and a lifetime of songs in her heart. She delivered her debut Grammy performance that was nothing short of historic and emotional. Huma, as we gear up for the 3050 Summit in Abu Dhabi, which is less than a month away, not nervous, uh, isn't this what 50 over 50 is all about. I think she's got to be on the next list. She absolutely needs to be on the next list. And I think what the Grammy showed us the other night is that true star power is ageless. And to the theme of our conference, it's all about mentorship and intergenerational and global uh, learning, sharing of ideas, inspiration. I love that it was Luke Combs who used uh, his sort of obsession with Tracy Chapman's uh, song from the 1980s, Fast Car, brings her back to stage. I mean, the, the energy, the hope, women won every competitive uh, award that evening. And it's why I think the Forbes 50 over 50 list, I mean, when you launched it, it was about the U.S. and now it's gone global. And that's because these conversations really affect. These are international icons, not just American icons. Joni Mitchell and Celine Dion, who's Canadian, of course, um, and Tracy Chapman, just to inspire this next generation. And then to see these young artists. I loved listening to all these interviews with these young artists who are about to be bigger and bigger names, saying they were so excited to watch Joni perform or watch Tracy Chapman perform. It's a true celebration of the spirit of creativity and hope and possibility. And frankly, we need it right now. Yeah, and also longevity, long Absolutely. runway. That's the message for everybody. But back to the political undercurrent here. As I've mentioned, Tay Tay, Taylor Swift, not only set a new milestone for anyone in music, she also, being a brand expert, announced a forthcoming album, Always a Businesswoman, always churning out the hits. Remember, she's busy re-recording her own music on her own terms after her catalog was sold out from under her. Taylor's a fighter. And by the way, does she ever sleep? I just want to know personally. I think her influence in the presidential race could actually move the meter. Stay with me here. She backed Joe Biden in the 2020 race. And her Instagram post, her Instagram post last year, got tens of thousands of new voters to register. And then, and then there's the NFL. As we all know, she's dating Kansas City tight end Travis Kelsey, making inroads with a voting block that seems to, let's just say, well, some of it leans a little Trumpy. Can I say that? You see, the football world is kind of a hold over the Trump narrative, both on and off the field and even over the airwaves. We've all heard this sort of bro culture on football talk shows and podcasts where disinformation and conspiracies are sort of woven into the conversation i think typically speaking because i'm healthy and i take care of myself um 
getting vaccinated was not on the top of my list. Shocker. Who what did, is your problem? Who did he coach for before? I thought this was his first gig. No, yeah, he got hired because him and Booney are buddies, okay? Yeah, Yankees, oh, my the God. You're a pig right they now. They needed to the glove. You son of a <laughs> You son of a <laughs> <laughs> Good scrap, boys. Good scrap. So this Sunday, all eyes will be on Swift and the Super Bowl. And that's where I think the Biden team should lean in on this girl power. If anyone can counter the dumb, dumb, Trumpy bro culture in football, it's Taylor and her zillions of fans. Jen, uh, is the all-American world of football a voting bloc that has, let's just say, room for opportunity for the Biden campaign? And how do they get in there? Yeah, first of all, I am obviously a Democrat. I watch football every weekend. We are planning our Super Bowl. But you're right, there is a Good. conservative <laughs> lean of a lot of the viewership. I think what's important here for the Biden team as they look to this is, you know, how can they appeal to people who just want to be able to watch football on Sundays or Monday nights and not worry that the country is falling apart? Yes, there are certainly some MAGA people who are watching football, but there are also just normal people living their lives, planning out their chicken wings for Sunday, right? And that is part yeah. of the voting block that the Biden campaign needs to appeal to and I think will appeal to. One of the most interesting things they're doing, which unfortunately we don't always see, is really using social media platforms in terms of enga as an organizing tool, Mika, right? In terms of engaging right, people right. privately. And maybe there are Biden football groups that are happening in advance of Sunday. We'll certainly see. May I just add, since I have a moment here, I also want to see a yes. Tracy Chapman resurgence because I, yes. after seeing her performance, yes. I have been listening to her old albums in my car. I think we should all be rooting for a Tracy Chapman resurgence. I want her to go on tour. We can all go I together. I need that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, and yes. So, Huma, how can the Dems capitalize on the swift factor in states like, I don't know, Florida, where, I mean... I, she does have like three concerts leading up to November. I'm just saying. Not only does she have three concerts uh, leading, uh, three concerts in November leading up to the election, she also has a song apparently on this new album coming out in April called Florida, which has gotten everyone all a Twitter about the Taylor touch and its possibilities. You know, I was talking to somebody about this earlier this morning. I'm not sure that celebrity endorsements necessarily directly lead to somebody voting for a candidate, in this case, for Joe Biden. But I do think what is especially powerful about what the Democratic Party in Florida is planning on doing, um, uh, which is organizing voter registration drives around her concerts, to Jen's point, getting people, you know, it, the point of organizing, registering, it's not, it's not just, uh, you know, a major mega, mega celebrity saying, I'm going to vote this way, this is what you should do. But I think what, what Taylor Swift can do, which is even more powerful than that, to say, look, get engaged, get involved, register to vote, it's important, and tap into millions of young people mm -hmm. or just people who may not necessarily vote to, to get engaged. And maybe that's how you can influence uh, people uh, in a certain way. But I think all of these little teasers is anything Taylor Swift does is going to keep all of our attention till November. Mm -hmm. So is going to get some attention. And, exactly and, and thank right. God, Travis Kelsey has her to thank for his stardom. <laughs> so, Simone, um, <laughs> how true. else can the Biden administration collaborate with her, other young people? The 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 youth voting bloc is is in a space right now that's confused, especially mm. with the Israel war and, and just there's a lot of different issues that are confusing them and perhaps pulling them away. Yeah, look, I think Gen Z, and I think it's really important that we delineate between Gen Z voters and millennial voters, right? Because the oldest millennial voters are 43, and the youngest millennials are, are 28. Gen Z voters, these are our college students, our folks right out of college um, who are on the cusp, maybe just starting their careers. And I, and I do think that particularly when it comes to the Israel-Hamas war, the conflict, there are a lot of younger voters, some older voters too, but younger voters who do feel some type of way about the images that they are seeing and would like to hear more from um, President Biden and the administration uh, about what they are doing to you know, respect the the and and advocate for the rights of the Palestinian people, which I, I, I think we all have seen these images and it is horrifying. Taylor Swift could be is 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 important because she speaks to the Gen Zers 
and the millennial women, right? Like, there, there, there's a range that went out to the concerts. We, I, I know I saw some bracelets. Um, I feel like Jen was there, okay? I know I saw I some was. bracelets at the time. <laughs> see? See? Look at this. Millennial, older millennial voter right here. So yeah. I, I don't, mm -hmm. I think that her power is not necessarily Taylor Swift standing next to, you know, President Biden or Vice President Harris. Mm -hmm. I think it is in her own place, in her own space and place. How can she organize and just encourage all of the people that listen to her and love her, that their voices yeah. matter in this election? And that is her Get power. Get out the vote. <laughs>